We are rolling. Okay. We are almost to the end of the book of Colossians. Okay? The epistle to the Colossians. We are going to be uh, in chapter 4, verses 2 to verse 9. Uh, the title of our lesson is Talk is Not Cheap. Don't let them take this ping pong ball up again. Talk is not cheap. Uh, let me read the verse 2 through 9. Paul continues on. Remember, he's given a specific, uh, specific guidelines and things to different parts of the people, or different parts of the uh, congregation in the book. He, in, in chapter 3, he started talking about Christian living. Then he moved into the Christian family and relationships. And then he moved into how servants and masters should be dealing with each other. Uh, verse or Chapter 4, verse 1, uh, he directs to uh, masters, saying, Give your bond servants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. And then uh, started picking up in verse 2, he says, Continue earnestly in prayer, <clears throat> being vigilant in it with thanksgiving, Meanwhile, praying also for us. In other words, he's saying, be continuously vigilant in prayer yourselves, okay? But also, if in the meantime, or while you're at it, he says, pray also for us, that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the, minister, the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest. Let's back up. What is, what is Paul talking about when he says, when he's talking, he's asking, meanwhile, praying also for us, he says that God would open to us a door for the word. What is he talking about here? To speak the mystery of Christ. What is he specifically asking here? That we can share. Share what? The gospel. The gospel. Good. So that he can share, so that they'll have an opportunity to share the gospel. And then he says, for which I am also in chains. What is he talking about there? How did, why did Paul end up in prison? Who was upset with him? Was it his own countrymen or was it the Gentiles that were upset? Huh? His own country? Yeah. The other Jews, right? Because they were upset that he was saying, they were thinking that he was telling them that they, or people don't have to pay attention to the law of Moses and all that. And uh, because Paul was, or uh, because Christ is enough, right? And he's preeminent. That's the whole uh, basis of the book of Okay, you don't have to have everything or something else plus Jesus. You just have to have Jesus, Jesus right? That's a, and, and that's why he ended up getting thrown into <coughs> thrown into prison. He says that's why I'm also in chains. Verse four, he says that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. In other words towards people who are outside of the faith, walking wisdom in their midst, okay? Let your speech, verse 6, always be seasoned, or always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Verse 7, Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me, and I am sending him to you for this very purpose that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. They will make known to you all things which are happening here. So he's drawing to the very end of his letter and he's telling them about Tychicus and Onesimus. I'm sure there's others that were there with him while he was in prison. Uh, obviously he got to have visitors there with him. But he's explaining to them and when they come, they'll explain to you more personally about what's going on with my life. But he's telling him, now at the very end, as he's wrapping it up, one of the most important things to be worried about uh, is prayer, right? <clears throat> All right. Getting into uh, Wiersbe's commentary. Talk is not cheap. He says, never underestimate the power of speech. A judge says a few words, and a man's life is saved or condemned. A doctor speaks a few words and a patient either rejoices ecstatically or gives up in despair. Whether the communication is oral or written, there is great power in words. I am told that for every word in Adolf 
Adolf Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, 125 persons lost their lives in World War II. The power of speech is a great or is a gift from God, and it must be used the way God ordains. In the book of James, the tongue is compared to a bridle and a rudder, a fire and a poisonous animal, and a fruitful tree and a fountain. These three pairs of pictures teach us that the tongue has the power to direct, the power to destroy, and the power to delight. The tongue is but a little member in our bodies, but it can accomplish great things for good or for evil. In this brief section, Paul pointed to four important ministries of speech. Okay, so in these seven verses, Paul points out four different things and ways of using speech in a productive and effective way, right? The first thing is prayer or praying. Okay? Paul talks about praying. Then, proclaiming. Witnessing. Very last, sharing burdens. <clears throat> In other words, a lot of like me explaining to you guys what's going on, and I'm asking for your prayers, right? Sharing burdens. Praying, proclaiming, witnessing, and sharing burdens are the four things that Paul touches on here. <clears throat> Praying. Prayer and worship are perhaps the highest uses of the gift of speech. Paul was not ashamed to ask his friends to pray for him. Even though he was an apostle, he needed prayer support for himself and his ministry. If a great Christian like Paul felt the need for prayer support, how much more do you and I need this kind of spiritual help? In these few words, Paul describes the characteristics of a satisfying and spiritual life. Question. Uh, how often do you ask for prayer from other people? Five or less times, maybe in a month. Ten or less times in a month. Uh, maybe it's just once or twice a month. Yeah. What is it? And, and right now, as you think about it, is there not more times that you need prayer? Mm -hmm. There is. So say say you got five times, five instances in your life. We'll say ten instances in your life out of a month, maybe a week, that you probably know that you should maybe ask somebody for prayer or again in retrospect you're looking back and you're saying maybe one out of ten times I actually asked somebody to pray for me. Would that be fair? I'm saying why is that? Why are you or why I, I put myself in that same category and my question is why don't we reach out and ask people to pray for us more? If we, if we will affirm that this is an effective thing, we know that prayer is something that we need, right? We know that great saints who walked before us desperately ask people to pray for them all the time. Why is it that we don't jump to that also, right? Why aren't we so quick to ask others to pray for us? Yeah. Is that connected to feeling like it's a burden also to pray for others when you know people need prayer? In other words, it's kind of like looking in a mirror, right? Like when I get a, a prayer, I get prayer this all a prayer request all the time from uh, who's the lady who sends us prayer requests? Janet. From Janet, right? And they come out maybe every other day, right? And most of the time when I look at the prayer request, I'm thinking, man, I'm I'm uh, I'm drowning myself, right? And I try to pray for him, right? Personally, I think that that's kind of that's the backside of the coin as to why we don't ask people to pray for us, right? Um, because I don't know. I'm just I'm just trying to think out loud with you guys. I want us to kind of think about that. Um, you don't want to feel like a burden. What else? No, I kind of like what you just said. You know, basically, it's I've got enough on my plate. That's how I view it sometimes. Like, I'm not going to ask somebody to worry about my stuff when I don't worry about their stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah. 
yeah. you know, your prayers. Yeah. You know, and I mean, I'm, exactly. I'm, I'm too busy trying to get this right. I've got, I can't worry about you and you. And, and you know, it, it tells us that we, we need to be forbearing. And I, I'm having a real hard time with that here lately. And that, that's one of the reasons why I'm like, I don't need help. What about worthiness? Do you ever feel like, <clears throat> but who am I to ask anybody to pray for me? I really don't. Daily. Yeah. Daily, I feel like that. When, when you really start to look at this grace, you, you know, I mean, grace is something that we don't deserve. And when you start to think about it, I mean, just even the word, you're like, I don't deserve that. What can I do to deserve any of this? Nothing. So, yeah, daily I feel like that. Yeah. So we, so we realize wherever it is that Paul's at, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother level of Christianity or uh, the we need to get to, but it's not, we can't just think, oh, well, I mean, I'm no Apostle Paul, right? Right. But just like Wiersbe just said, if Paul himself, if there's anybody else that I remember it out of the scripture more than Paul, I don't know of anybody else apart from Paul who asked for more prayer, mm -hmm. right? And, and yet he wrote, what, two-thirds of the New Testament, right? But he's, you always find him asking for prayer. Right. Please pray for me. Please pray. Pray that that this, now he, he's not praying that people or that God will take him or asking for prayer that God will take him out of the hard situations. What is he asking for? Well, this word that he may be used for God's purpose. Right. That there will be opportunities. But we do find him expressing, you know, the hardships and saying, you know, if it wasn't for people praying for us, we probably wouldn't have made it through. Right. So just food for thought. Keep that in mind. Uh, of course we're not worthy for anybody to pray for us, but that's not even a matter of a question, right? That's not right. even something that we should be worried about. That these people who need prayer and we feel like we can't even pray for them, do they deserve prayer? Do they deserve anybody to intercede for them? Do they deserve Christ to come and intercede for them? No, right? But this is where we step in and walk in fellowship in His work, okay? Knowing we too ourselves need somebody to pray for us, take you know five minutes to pray for somebody that we know needs prayer. Right? Uh, and the more we get in sync with that, and the more we have peace about that kind of stuff, I think the more we'll we'll be more open to saying, "Hey, you guys pray for us. You know what I mean? Or pray for me, or whatever the case is. Uh, it'll be more comfortable, and more easy." And the more bigger giants you face, you probably won't have any other uh, option but to cry out and have somebody to pray for you, right? Anyway, okay, first our praying must be faithful. Let me give you these, uh, these little things. Praying must be faithful. Must be watchful. Must be thankful. Praying ought to be purposeful. And uh, it should be from the heart. Just in case we don't get down to witnessing, I'll give you those two. Witnessing, you should walk wisely in the midst of folks. Wisely. And walking in wisdom. First, our praying must be faithful. Continue in prayer is the directive, okay? We read that in, in, in just now in verse 2. This means be steadfast in your prayer life, be devoted, and don't quit, okay? This is the way the early church prayed. And too many of us pray only occasionally, when we feel like it or when we or when there is a crisis. Pray without ceasing is God's command in 1 Thessalonians. This does not mean that we should walk around muttering prayers under our breath. Rather, it means we should be constantly in fellowship with God so that prayer is as, excuse me, is as normal as breathing. In other words, it's just your disposition. When you, when you stop and you're in between functions or whatever it is throughout your day or whatever, your, your disposition or your fallback mode is in fellowship with Him. 
right? So I don't know about anybody else, but I tend to talk to myself or whatever. I don't know whether it's talking to myself or something. I have that inner conversation, right? And uh, inner monologue. Inner monologue, but it's typically it's inner monologue with with Christ, right? <coughs> That's kind of that's what he's talking about. Grow to the point to where you're ever aware of his presence, and it's just a simple, it's your default mode again, right? In between functions during the day, where you just start communicating with the Lord. Does that make sense? This is not to suggest that God is reluctant to answer our prayer and that we must wear him out by our praying. Quite the opposite is true. God enjoys answering our prayers, but he sometimes delays the answer to increase our faith and devotion and to accomplish his purposes at the right time. God's delays are not always God's denials. He, or as we continue in prayer, our own hearts are prepared for the answer God will give. We will find ourselves growing in grace even more, or even before his answer comes. So he says, as we continue in prayer, our own hearts are prepared for the answer God will give. So we see that it's not necessarily God giving us what we're asking him for, but through more and more fellowship with him, our hearts and our desires are changed to line up more with his will. Does that make sense? Uh, what's the scripture that says... Uh, Proverbs, I think it's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Glorify him in all your ways and uh, all your requests. All his your requests will be made known to you. Or something like that. But essentially what it's saying is through more and more walk with the Lord, it'll be his desires that come through your heart that you will. In other words, he'll give you the things that you should desire, right? And it, it, it does, what it doesn't mean is you can ask whatever you want, right? And you do it fervently enough and repetitively enough, and he'll give it to you, right? That's that's witchcraft or whatever, right? It's not God. The more you walk and become more conformed to the image of Christ, the more you'll have the, the desire that Christ has. And then naturally, whatever you ask for is what the Lord is intending to give you anyway. Does that make sense? Our praying must also be watchful. We must be awake and alert as we pray. The phrase watch and pray is used often in the Bible. It had its beginning in Bible history when Nehemiah was rebuilding the walls and the gates of Jerusalem. You guys remember the story of Nehemiah? Right? What was he doing? What was Nehemiah doing in the Old Testament? They were rebuilding the temple, or rebuilding the walls around, not the temple, rebuilding the walls around the city of Jerusalem, you remember? And uh, I can't remember the character that was there that was always heckling him, hassling him, right? But they were worried about the other, the other nation coming and attacking them while they were trying to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem, you remember? And uh, it says at one time that they were, they were basically building, rebuilding the walls with one hand and had their hand on their sword or, you know, had the sword in their hand at the same time, right? So when he says, be watchful, this is kind of the same way, uh, the same idea here. Nevertheless, uh, this is from the book of Nehemiah, chapter 4, verse 9. He says, and this is Nehemiah speaking. He says, nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them, that is the enemy, day and night. So they had guys that were rebuilding the wall, and at the same time, or they were doing God's work, essentially, and then at the same time, as they were doing God's work, they had people who were watching, right? And they were working together as one unit. So being watchful and doing God's work at the same time. Jesus used the phrase also, watch and pray. Paul used it also in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18. There is no power in dull, listless praying. If there is no fire on the altar, the incense will not rise to God. Real praying demands spiritual energy and alertness. And this can come only from the Holy Spirit of God. Routine prayers are unanswered prayers. Our praying should be should also be thankful. Watch in the same with thanksgiving, he says. Thanksgiving is an important ingredient in successful praying. If all we do is ask and never thank God for his gifts, 
we are selfish. Sincere gratitude to God is one of the best ways to put fervor into our praying. Anybody ever experienced that? God give you something you prayed for, and uh, you didn't stick around very long to thank him for it. Uh, I've been there. Not only that, something else that just came to my mind is forgetting about the things that God's brought you through or brought you over or delivered you from in the past, right? And not remembering those things causes your, in the meantime or right now time, when you're facing another giant, causes you to be weak in prayer, right? Because you're not remembering. God, look, God delivered you from the lion and the bear before, right? And what did David say? I mean, God delivered me from those things. What's this Philistine here? I ain't worried about that, right? Well, that's because he had his mind remembering the things that God had delivered him from before, right? There's always so much to be thankful for. We have already noted the emphasis in Paul's letter to the Colossians on Thanksgiving. When we recall that Paul was a prisoner when he wrote this letter, it makes this emphasis even more wonderful. Finally, our praying ought to be purposeful. Praying also for us, Paul says. He says, too often our prayers are vague in general. Lord, bless this, bless the missionaries. Or how much better would it be if we would pray for specific needs? And by doing so, we would know when God answered and we could praise him for it. Perhaps it is our lack of faith that causes us to pray generally instead of specifically. How specific do you get in your prayer? Now, I understand we probably all consider ourselves on a scale of 1 to 10 and like a 1 and a half in our prayer, right? Yeah. But you understand what he's talking about, the importance of praying specifically, right? If for nothing else, it's so when God does something, you know for a fact that he's the one that touched it, right? Does that make sense? Uh, not so far as to go... Uh, and say, well, Lord, let the grass be wet and the fleece be dry, right? Or the fleece be wet and the grass be dry, right? Everybody remember that story? Um, I can't remember the character's name now. We talked about that, or we did that. But you get what I'm saying. It has well been said that the purpose of prayer is not to get man's will done in heaven, but to get God's will done on earth. Prayer is not telling God what to do or what to give. Prayer is asking God for that which he wants to do and give according to his will. In other words, like we were saying earlier, your heart becomes conformed to what it is that God wants on the earth, right? And whether you recognize it or you don't, eventually you begin to ask God for the things that God wants you to ask for him, right? Prayer, let's see. Claiming the word, uh, Paul did not ask for the prison doors to be opened, but the doors of ministry might be opened. It was more important to Paul that he be a faithful minister than a free man. It is worth noting that in all of Paul's prison years, his concern was not for personal safety or material health, but for spiritual character and blessing. Again, he wasn't asking that God would take him out of the hard situation but that God would open up opportunities for God's will to be done. Paul was in prison because of the mystery of Christ, which related to the Gentiles. The mystery involved God's purpose for the Gentiles in relation to Israel. For in the church, Jews and Gentiles are one. Read the account of Paul's arrest in the Jewish temple. Note that the Jews listened to Paul until he spoke the word Gentiles. It was Paul's concern for the Gentiles and his ministry to them that put him in prison. That's what Lindsay was talking about. Even among some believing Jews, there was a kind of bigotry that wanted to force the Gentiles into a lower position. This extreme legalistic party wanted the Gentiles to become Jews ceremonially before they could become Christian. Paul and Barnabas met this threat to the gospel of grace head on, and the council decided in their favor but the legalistic party continued to oppose Paul and his ministry. They did not want the good news of the mystery of Christ to get to the Gentiles. They wanted to maintain their air of Jewish superiority. <clears throat> Again, uh, the second importance of speech that Paul's talking about is what? 
proclaiming, proclaiming the word. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Moving on to witnessing. Them that are without refers to those who are outside the family of God. Jesus made a distinction between his disciples and those who were outside. Paul also made this same distinction. Of us who are born again are the spiritual insiders because we belong to God's family and share his life. Is everybody aware of that? Have you ever felt that feeling uh, amongst people that you know aren't believers? And you, can kind of, you can just feel the difference of who you are right, in Christ. And not that you feel superior to them, but almost pitiful for them or you pity them, right? Uh, but everybody understands you, you felt that way. However, as Christians, we must never have a sanctified superiority complex. We have a responsibility to witness to the lost around us and to seek to bring them into God's family. To begin with, we have the responsibility to walk wisely. Walk refers, of course, to our conduct in daily life. The unsaved outsiders watch us Christians and are very critical of us. There must be nothing in our lives that would jeopardize our testimony. What's one way you can jeopardize your testimony? Ooh. Speech. Wait. <clears throat> in what way? Filthy language. <clears throat> there in the beginning right <laughs> but as you as you grow you should know right modest is hottest <laughs> <laughs> I knew somebody Perfect. was going to say it. I've never heard that but let's go modest is hottest what about you guys what's a way you can uh, destroy your testimony or ruin your testimony and what do we mean by ruining our testimony what uh, we, oh. got, we got we got Gen not Gentiles, people outside of the church watching being very critical of us. Uh, well, it's like why I'm, is this even important? <clears throat> well, it's like I'm dealing with right now, like the guys at my jiu-jitsu class, they're like, they, they know I'm going back to church, and one of them looked at me, and he was like, you go to Sunday school? You said the place didn't catch on fire? And I was like, well, no. And he was like, how does somebody like you just, you know, just decide that they're going to change? And before filthy language, God, I mean, all that that's on that list, we'd sit there and talk about it. And he was like, well, what made you change? I was like, you just get tired of the same old thing. But that that's how it can change your testimony, because people around you will notice how you're acting, and if you're calling yourself a Christian, you better act like it. Or what? What will happen? Why would I want to be any part of that? If that's how you're going to act, and there's no change in you, why would I want any part? I'm doing just fine the way I am now. Right. If you're called to a higher purpose and you're doing the same thing I'm doing, you're no better than I am. So I, I deal with that a lot because, I mean, I was all those things. <laughs> and people look at me and, like I said, they, you, you go to church? And I'm like, well, yeah, you know, I'm trying for something different in my life. Like being judgy or being critical of people can ruin your testimony. Like whether or not how, like this whole transgender thing is tough because you want, like you can't just shun them. You have to bring them in and love them. And I guess with time, they're gonna you'll be able to lead them by your witness, your your lifestyle. Yeah, it's it's hard, right? Uh, uh, for for whatever reason that 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 whole scene, the homosexual scene and everything, like it just I don't know, it's like nails on a chalkboard for me, right? And I'm not, uh, I mean, I don't go picket and go out and spit on them or something in the street or something like that. 
but there's just something about it that the spirit of God inside of me gets irate, irate right? I'm, I'm um, right there with you. Thinking about it, and like when we had that dinner, and Mar and Martina showed up with his boyfriend, right? Uh, on my way up there, I'm thinking, okay, I was praying, or I was just thinking out loud, I don't like to deal with this and, and be Lord, let you show. I know through the study of scripture and seeing how Jesus dealt with people, right? He didn't kick them while they were down, right? Very rarely did he even really uh, attack them, or he, he never really, well, the Pharisees, he bashed them pretty hard, right? But um, a lot of times he didn't really even specifically cut somebody down over what they were doing wrong. He just loved them until there was an opportunity or until they realized who he was and they realized they were wrong. He didn't kick them again while they were down. What did he say? Go and don't do it anymore. I don't want to sin no more. Right? Uh, so I found myself pitying this guy, right? Uh, <clears throat> sitting across from me, even though everything about him was making me cringe. Okay? Let's be honest. <laughs> But uh, but I I politely just started talking to the guy, you know, and and, uh, and I you know I felt that uh, compassion for him. And again, we gotta remember that they they're freaking they're in the dark, man. They don't know any different. Why would we want to bash them? Right? Uh, it's it's a very fine line to walk. And if you're not a mature, if you're not a mature Christian, if if you're not a mature Christian, then then probably one of two things will happen. You'll completely avoid a situation like that or you will, you will uh, handle it in a very bad way. Right? Um, so it just takes it just takes time. And uh, one of the greatest things that you can do in learning how to deal with people like that or anybody outside of the faith is look at how Jesus dealt with people. Right? Just watch how he treated each other or treated everybody that he came in contact with. Let's see, my dear needs to draw on my hug. You said kindness of the Lord that we have to push our comforts. Yeah. Not the kind of Yeah. They'll, they'll, it, when I, at my old job, I had witnessed to another gay guy uh, when I was delivering. And I, I really just got into a, a really good conversation and witnessing with this guy. And, and I, if I remember correctly, he was like, you know, or I could feel and through his comments, through what he was saying, he was like, you know who I am. Why are you being nice to me? Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I walked away knowing that the Lord was able to influence him in some, in some way through me just being kind. And I had the same ideas then as I do now, right? Uh, but my wife also has kept me in check when I was eating. For some reason, she has a lot of compassion for those, for uh, people like that. So, amen. Uh, the Lord does a lot of work with my wife and she and me. Anybody else? No? Uh, let's see. And then sharing the burden. So, witnessing, witnessing to the lost, we understand why it's important to, uh, if we're going to testify of Christ then you know we gotta keep these things we gotta do away with these things put them to death right that way we have a good walk or we have a good testimony before them uh, and then sharing burdens we kind of talked about this touched on it earlier before uh, but Paul wanted the Colossians to know the facts and how to pray for them right so Something that we can work on is um, let's get over ourselves, and you know maybe we'll be more apt to pray for others if we're more apt to ask others to pray for us. Right? Um, I mean, we're directed to ask people or ask for prayer, right? Or if not directed, maybe direct is not the right word. I don't know if that's even a commandment. Ask others to pray for you, but 
I mean, all the apostles did, and the Paul did multiple, multiple times. If nothing else, we have a great example for us. And uh, so, something that we can think about. Amen. Talk is not cheap. You may got anything? Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for uh, this opportunity to be in your word. I love you and praise you. and ask that you uh, would be with us in service, Lord. Help us to focus our minds on you and worship you, Lord, in spirit and in truth. We ask that you give our pastor great, great power and strength and uh, clarity of mind, Lord, so he can deliver your word. We plead your blood, Lord Jesus, over uh, this whole campus. And we ask